I was joking with uh, Mark Barber, our guest today, about how we're going to have a lively Wednesday evening talking about taxes. You all clearly have nothing better to do, so we're glad to we're glad to have you. And uh, we have we have some great information to talk about. You know, and first of all, I want to say the last time we did a webinar uh, was with Mark, and it was during the depths of the COVID lockdown. Back, I uh, what do you think, Mark? Wasn't that April last year? I think something like that. It was just about a year ago, exactly. Oh man, uh, if you had a time machine to go back and tell yourself, hey, it's uh, your investments are probably going to be okay. I mean, nobody really knew what was going to happen at that point. It was. It's been an interesting time. And I just wanted to give everybody a very brief update on uh, we call it state of the fig and what's been happening around here before we get into why you really came, which was to hear Mark talk about some of these tax advantages and some possible changes that may be on the horizon. Um, first of all, we're, we're glad you made it. I know that everybody has been impacted by COVID differently on in different levels and the fact that you're here, you're still thinking about investing and uh, we love that. We're glad that you're sticking around, that you're still paying attention. We think we have some important things to say. As, as far as the performance of the FIG assets across the country, uh, it's it's largely gone pretty well. I think from March through May of last year, once again, was anybody's guess as to how things were going to end up. Things were pretty much frozen across the board. We were really wondering what would happen happen with leasing. Um, it, initially, when, when this lockdown began with COVID, um, we were wondering what would happen with construction? Well, that actually went great guns, never even stopped. Right now, construction is, is the challenge that we're working our, ways th our way through. But beginning about May of last year, the leasing just heated up and people have really been looking for a little bit square, bigger square footage, getting away from jam-packed apartments in the cities and the, the townhome and the stack product we've been doing in the suburbs has performed pretty well. Um, so we're, we're happy to see that. Right now, it's no secret to all of you that construction is a nightmare for everybody. Materials or uh, pricing is changing all the time and it, it's difficult to keep your arms around that. So we're getting innovative over here and uh, doing our best to keep up with those changes. But so far we're able to to continue marching forward and building, although at a, a definitely at an increased cost. So many investors who closed on construction loans with those fixed bid contracts are very happy campers right now because the, that two by four that they paid for now costs a lot more, but they already paid for it. So that's always a good thing. We have a multiple new projects that we're working on right now. I know many people are frustrated. They wanna know when the next project is coming through. We're working on it. We have multiple projects under contract in Utah and Arizona. We've even got some back under contract in Houston and in Boise right now. It's uh, getting harder to do. You have to push out into the suburbs and you of course have to make sure if you're going onto the outskirts that that makes sense. You don't wanna buy land just to buy it. There needs to be genuine organic demand for the rental product there. And then if you're buying more infill within the city, that's great. But at this point in the market with this run that we've been on, the land that's left is the land that has a lot of hair on it. So moving these things through the various cities and the approval processes is a little trickier than we would like, but there's a lot coming. So please continue to stay in touch with us. We anticipate releasing a, a lot more new product this year. So uh, I, I said that things have changed a little bit since we last talked. And Right now, what's on the top of a lot of people's minds is taxes, as always. That's why a lot of people invest in real estate. And Mark Barber has been an invaluable asset for many of our clients when it comes to depreciation, cost segregation. We're going to talk about 45L. And he has his fingers on the pulse of what might come down the pipe with a new administration in office and how does that potentially affect us. And we're going to keep in touch with him. We're going to give you his contact information. So you're welcome to reach out to him, whether it's whether you need his services on one of our properties or something else that you own, he can he can likely help there. So I like Mark because he kind of approached me after doing some cost segregation studies for a client of ours and we got to talking and I thought he, he does a very good in-depth study. Uh, we've since referred buckets and buckets of clients to him that have saved a lot in taxes. And, and Mark really, it was funny how he approached me. He said, hey, Steve, do you have any idea what you have here? The way these are built and 
And with the energy code and the options that are available, I said, I guess not. I mean, let, tell us about it. And we were able to find some more great advantages to investing in new construction fourplexes. So he's going to talk about um, some of the things that he sees as being an advantage to fourplexes. Um, I, you know, they're not a shameless plug. I have shame, but he's going to talk about why why the fig opportunity is good. And then we're going to get specifically into um, energy credits and real estate professional status, cost seg. That might be a review to some of you. Then launch into what's on the horizon with uh, potential new tax changes. Mark, did that put you to sleep? You good? No, Steve, thank you for the warm introduction, a wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. I appreciate you having me back here to talk to the FIG investors. Um, we're going to go through the slide deck. We're not going to beat any of these slides to death. Um, I'm sure a lot of you folks have seen a lot of what we're talking about, but um, we'll go through them. And then if anybody you know, has any questions, I'd like to make it more of a Q&A type of uh, forum at the end. So I think Steve will be moderating those. Yeah, you can put questions in the chat, everybody, too. That's a that's a good way to do it because I we got to keep a, a bit of a leash on it when we're getting into accounting because people can ask a question and it just applies so differently to everybody. So we got to kind of watch that. But it, it, go ahead and put them in so the chat. True. It's very true, Steve. Everybody's situation is very unique, and we can handle those uh, you know questions um, after this after this slow after the show or you know later on. Folks can reach out to me individually. So just as an introduction, my company is Specialty Tax Advisors. I've been working with uh, folks at FIG for over a year now, and we're gonna talk about the tax advantages of owning fourplexes. Uh, we'll go through this disclaimer. Um, and you know, reasons to purchase a fourplex, I would say over a single family home, um, you know, you've got the same type of financing, the one to four that applies as for, same for a single family home as it does for four. And typically you're limited to 10 loans from, from, from uh, you know, local banks and, and, and money center banks. So why not have 40 properties instead of 10? You know, the financing is just as easy. It's a great starter property um, and it's a great, you know, a great chance to wet your feet. And, you know, with the folks at FIG, you know, they do a really good job at explaining the process and taking you through the process. Um, you know, you've got... With FIG, you've got new construction, you've got, you know, they're, they've done the research, they're going into great markets, you know, Utah County, <clears throat> the Boise uh, MSA, you've got Texas, and you've got Arizona. They've spent a lot of time researching these MSA and sub markets uh, that are super high in population and job growth. Can I interrupt one thing sure. and ask you a question? Um, I, I say this because you do cost seg studies all over the country. So genuinely, what, what is it that you think that makes you, you mentioned, you know, Utah County and Boise specifically in your eyes, doing it all across the country? Why, why are those good markets? Well, you know, historically, there's been um, excellent job growth, very uh, the, the localities and the municipalities and the counties are very uh, open. You know, their economic development arms are very pro, uh, you know, job growth and pro companies. They're offering a lot of local incentives for companies to move in. Um, I, I don't know if anybody watched, uh, it was either this past week or the week before on a Sunday morning show about the explosive growth of Boise and almost, I think it was year over year, 30% increase. It, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and, you know, obviously Arizona and Texas are other booming markets. So, I mean, when you have strong underlying economic fundamentals in the market, it, it really makes for, you know, good, good uh, drivers for, the, for rental. Um, so we can talk a little bit next about, you know, real estate professional. You know, the tax code as it's currently written uh, really uh, favors a real estate professional um, status. Now, what does that mean? Uh, you know, you, you've got to provide more than half of your total time, um, you know, into, into which you material participate into real property trades or businesses. So if you're a real estate broker or agent, that may not uh, necessarily get you there because you have to perform 750 hours of services in your specific real property trades or businesses. Um, now, Really, that is going to require an action plan to how you can achieve that. You know, if you're a couple, 
let's say, I mean, if you're a doctor and you're working, you know, a W-2 wage and you've got 40 hours a week pretty much committed to that, can you really, are you really going to, if you're single, are you really going to be able to convince the IRS that, you know, you're spending over 2,000, you know, 80, 40 hours, 80 hours a week, 40 hours plus on, on real estate? That's really not going to pass the, the sniff test there. Um, so these are some of the the, the, the plans, you know, just outlined here. So you can, you know, to achieve real estate professional status, you know, it's, it's not an easy status to achieve. You really have to, to keep track of all of your hours. Um, you know, folks who are acquiring multiple properties in a year um, and really putting a lot of rehab into them, I would recommend that. You know, on top of, uh, you know, FIG properties tend to be third party managed. So it's kind of hard to get all your hours just on FIG. Um, so you really, you, and there's, and there, and there's other, there's other, uh, you know, there's other activities that do and do not qualify. And I've got lists of those, if, you know, if you want to reach out to me separately on those. So why don't we get into cost segregation and you know what what is cost segregation? The history of cost segregation, um, the seminal case is the Hospital Corporation of America case, where HCA fought the IRS and won, and they basically you know said that a lot of our property in these hospitals is not you know 39 year property. There's a lot of personal property, and it extends to property that's inside the walls, like gas lines, electrical lines. Um, not just what you can see, which would be floor coverings and paint. So they won that case. And, you know, that really set the case for breaking property, separating what we would call structural assets from non-structural assets. And the non-structural assets we can separate into five, seven, and 15 year lives. Now, why is that so valuable now? So that's sort of the curve of how cost segregation typically looks with your five-year property depreciating quicker and then your 15-year property and then so on into your 27 and a half and 39-year property. The well, gist of it, Mark, being like you said, anybody who gets a real estate license knows you depreciate residential assets over 27 and a half years and commercial over 39. But when have you ever had a water heater last 27 and a half years? Right. Uh, obviously, many of those components depreciate much faster. Is that a fair summary? It is. So if, if you think about, so this, this is sort of traditional cost segregation, the way this chart is. But if, if you think about bonus depreciation, bonus depreciation, actually, the way the tax code is written now, and we know that what's happening now in Washington is basically folks are trying to undo the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. I mean, that's pretty much what's going on in Washington now. Uh, you know, we could have fixed somebody's name to it, but, but I, you know, I think we all know what's happening. So with bonus depreciation, all of this depreciation in here is basically being front loaded into year one. So, you know, it, you can basically, as a rule of thumb, think about 25 to 30% of your cost basis in your asset can be taken in year one. Now, if you're an act, if you're a passive real estate investor, does it really matter, especially if you only have one property? It may or may not. You know, you really have to take a look at your entire tax status. Now, if you have multiple properties, what we see people doing, and if you've owned real estate for a long time, they're basically buying these, what we call them sort of as tax bullets, because on a fig property, let's say you've got about 600,000 to 700,000 in basis, you're basically gonna have about 180 to $210,000 of immediate write-offs in your first year. Now, for a passive investor, unless they have lots of other passive income, doesn't really make it probably it may or may not make a big difference. But if you're an active investor and um, you've got, you know, w, you've got a spouse with large W-2 income, it can make all the difference in the world um, because you can then use you can take all your income becomes active as well as your your paper losses, which are primarily depreciation losses. So you can actually use a lot of tax planning strategies to eliminate that w, big W-2 or other income on the other side. So basically, I mean, we can all read through these slides later, but the benefits of cost segregation is primarily time value of money. Um, you're basically front loading depreciation. It's, it's not like you're going to, um, 
you, you know, you're gonna, it's, it's basically front loading the depreciation. So you're taking more up front and less later on. Um, you can also do a cost segregation study on a property that say was placed into service 10 years ago. Uh, and what you'll do is all that five and 15 year property that should have been de already depreciated most of it, um, you will catch that up in a single year. Um, you don't have to amend returns. You just simply file a form 3115, which is a change in accounting method, which is fairly um, automatic and we can get into the mechanics of that. Um, one of the other great things um, under the CARES Act was they snuck in that net operating losses um, that arise during 2018 to 2020 can now be carried back five years at 100%. Previously, they were capped at 80%. So that is a strategy that a lot of folks are now going back and looking at cost setting properties they had um, you know, in, in the 2018 to 2020 period and then carrying those losses back. Because under the the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017, NOLs, I think they were previously two years, were done away with. So you could not carry back your losses anymore. But the CARES Act temporarily brought that back. So there's some great tax planning opportunities there. So you could look back five years and, and take, you can deduct 100% of your losses over that five years uh, retroactively? Yeah, so let's say you bought a fake property in 2020, um, and you had 100, you, you generated $180,000 in losses, then you probably didn't have much, you know, fig income to start with in that year. So you've got 180,000 in losses, depending on if you're an active or passive investor, you know, you can carry those losses back versus active or passive income. Mm. Okay. So that's, you know, that's a taxpayer by taxpayer uh, situation okay. it's to be aware of because it's, it's, they're not sending out postcards. <laughs> they don't they want to do it but they don't want you to do it <laughs> yeah, exactly so just this is a good way to look at um different property types from residential rental to assisted living golf courses manufacturing restaurants but typically right in here this 30 percent line that's a good rule of thumb you know if you have a warehouse it's pretty much a shell you're not going to have that much uh you might have you might be lucky if you got 20. Um, hmm. and, and, you know, bonus depreciation on new construction. Let me just give you a little history on bonus because this is important. So bonus depreciation has been around in some form or another since 9-11. It only applied historically to new construction. So it was designed, you know, since we know what happened on 9-11, it was designed to promote economic activity. So some years it was 50%, some years it was 30%. There were a few years where it lapsed and some years it was 100%, but always new construction. Well, in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they somehow got it to apply to used or already constructed property. So you could buy a building that was 30 years old, say an apartment building built in you know, 1980, um, and you would still be able to 100% depreciate, you know, thir about 30%, whatever we could segregate into the five and 15 year property, that's what is subject to 100% bonus depreciation because bonus depreciation applies to property with a 20 year, uh, 20 year life or less. And what we're segregating out is the five year property, which is things you can see like crown molding and flooring and things you can't see like process wiring and process plumbing in the walls. Um, and that's where we actually get a lot of our yield from. Hmm. Now, how is there are elements to a quality cost segregation? The IRS actually publishes an audit techniques guide, which is not law, but it's basically a playbook for their auditors. And there are 13 principal elements in a cost segregation study. And these are some of them right here. Uh, there's a narrative report, schedule of assets, you know, schedule of uh, direct and indirect costs and on and on. So your statement of your engineering procedures, statement of assumptions of limiting conditions. And I can, there's a link, if you want to email me, I can provide you all of the links and support to this. Um, again, these are, site visit is absolutely, um, you know, mandated. Um, interviews with appropriate parties, use of a co common nomenclature and on and on. 
we also consider well, this was a hot item a few years ago the, uh, the repair regulation so not only do we specifically call out the five and 15 year property and we do it to the nth degree in engineering detail we also call out all of the elements of the 39 year property so if there was any type of you know damage or you know you wanted to move a wall you, you would actually have a be able to quantify that and be able to write off that portion uh, whatever useful life is left undepreciated life so we had a case study um this is one of the brickyard units and i believe the um the basis was about six hundred thousand dollars for this property meridian idaho for everybody's information okay and the first year depreciation without the cost seg would have been eleven thousand seven hundred eleven dollars with the cost seg we got one hundred seventy four thousand nine hundred three. so the difference is over one hundred and sixty three thousand dollars now really you have to look at like we talked everybody's tax situation is unique um, and this $163,000, your first year of ownership, you're probably not going to have a lot of rent. So you're going to have, you're going to be able to generate a lot of loss. And then, you know, whether you can use it or not is up to your individual tax situation. And under the CARES Act, there are some options there. Plus the loss, you know, here's another thing to think about, you know, with, with all the efforts that are being, undo, uh, you know, put forth to undo the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. You know, you might want to think about just taking that, doing the cost seg to generate that bonus depreciation because who knows if it's going to be around. It's actually scheduled to roll off over the next, I think it's four to five years. Uh, 2022, it's scheduled for 100%. And then I think it rolls off in 20% increments, 80%, 60%, 40%, something like that to 2026. You know, but all these have tremendous costs, you know, um, on the budget. So I would see that as something the Biden administration might go after. Uh, again, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. So taxpayers can expense 100% of the cost of qualified property acquired and placed in service. And this is the magic date after 927 of 17 and before January 1st of 2023 and then it falls off 20%. So, you know, with tax, what's gonna happen with taxes? I, you know, will they, if they make changes this year, will they bring it retroactive? That would be the biggest question in my mind. Uh, generally, when tax changes happen toward the end of the year, they really, they really go into effect the following year. But, you know, we have a, a pretty radical administration in there right now, so we don't know. And this was the key right here. Uh, provision expands property eligible for immediate expensing to include used property. I really don't know how they got that in there, but they did. Which really doesn't apply to FIG because FIG is new construction, but it really probably applies to most acquisitions in real estate. Again, bonus is acquired or used property. Um, and these are just some you know property between 928 of 17 and 1231 of 17 have some special rules. And you really don't have to take the 100% bonus in one year, you can actually spread it out over four years. Uh, but again, we've looked at this slide already, it just basically gives uh, rough percentages. And the reason why golf courses have such a high percentage is because it's mostly land improvements, which is 15 year property, which is subject to 100% bonus for now. Again, these are, you know, just rough sort of percentages of asset reclassification. Now, the 45L tax credit applies to FIG. Um, investors because the 45L tax credit um, is, is uh, the eligible, um, I guess the eligible, uh, invest, the investor is the eligible contractor because the investor is the one who takes the economic risk. So that is the person who's eligible for the tax savings. Because they go on title, they get a construction loan, they're, they're not buying a completed unit from a builder who took that risk. That's is right. that a fair summary? Okay. They put down an, a deposit and they took the risk of the construction loan. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, that's exactly right. 
And so what 45L came into being uh, way back when, 2005, George Bush was actually the president. You know, Obama gets a lot of credit for this energy efficiency, but actually the Energy Policy Act of 2005 um, created 45L and it said, if you can, um, if the, <clears throat> a builder or eligible contractor can build units to achieve a 50% energy savings uh, versus a baseline 2006 International Energy Conservation Code standard. And 10% of that has to at least come from building envelope improvements, which are primarily insulation and windows. Then they're eligible for a $2,000 per unit um, tax credit. And that's a dollar for dollar tax credit against taxes owed. It's not a deduction, it's actually a credit. Um, and it, it, depending on how the uh, property is owned, it, it, it basically flows through. If, you're the, if you hold it in your individual name, it flows through directly to the individual. If it's in an LLC, it flows through to the members or K-1 shareholders, depending on if it's an LLC or an S corp or a corp. If it's, if, it's a, if it's a corp, then you take it at the corporate level, but I don't see a lot of real estate held in corps, just C corps. Mm -hmm. Um, and actually, the nice thing about it is you can, if you built a unit three years ago, you can actually go back and get it. So if you had a, if you haven't filed your taxes yet, or even if you had, you can, you know, you can amend, you can go back three years for the most recent open tax return. So if you haven't filed your taxes for 2020 and, and you, and you purchased big, big units back to 2017, you could still go get it if you've already filed 2018. Um, but and that requires amending the tax return. Now, it's pretty interesting that, the, that this act was passed under, you know, when Bush was president, um, but it has been extended and uh, four times. And, um, you know, some, it's not always extended every year. Like sometimes, you know, the, the provision will sunset at the end of this year in 2021, but there was a similar uh, commercial um, provision. It's a deduction. It's called 1779 capital D. And it's, it was actually just made permanent under the, under the last uh, uh, the final legislation before Trump le left office, uh, interestingly enough. And, you know, the language around 45L is always, every time you read the language, it, it mentions the word, the term climate plan. So we know who's in office. We know some of their what their hot buttons are. So we have a pretty strong sentiment that this is going to be renewed, um, and it might be enhanced. It might go up above two thousand dollars a unit. You know, they haven't increased the baseline standard in a long time. That two thousand and six standard. We've heard that they might bring it up to a twenty eighteen standard, but then instead of requiring a five zero percent savings, they're going to require like a one five 15 percent savings so we're still confident it's going to be very easy to not easy but attainable um it's only available for any dwelling units that are three stories or less so the, a lot of the fig i think there's only one fig prop project that i know about that's four stories so almost every fig project will qualify for 45l question mark um let's say I mean, we already established that when you close on land with a construction loan, you're essentially the builder. You probably qualify for 45L. What if you own like a rental property and you decide to renovate it? Can you do a 45L after that if you were kind of oversaw that renovation versus if you bought it completed, obviously you didn't do any of that risk. Tell me what you think about that. No, that's a great question. And we've done that for several uh, fig investors, uh, folks who've gone in and really done you know, complete renovation, including HVAC, hot water heaters, you know, taking the property down to the studs in most cases, putting in new insulation. Those will generally qualify uh, for that $2,000 per unit tax credit. So we've seen a lot of big investors renovate fourplexes, duplexes, and they qualify for those. Uh, gotcha. Okay. They, may, they may qualify for, um, you know, we'd be happy to take a look at. Okay. Again, so the process involves that we examine the plans and the tech, uh, technical documentation. Uh, with those, we just do sort of a pre-qualification. Once we determine that the property is qualified, we enter to an engagement with the, uh, with, the, with the property owner. 
then we conduct a site visit and we actually run the models um, according to the IRS approved software. Uh, we run these simulations and uh, you know if, if we can determine that the dwelling units were 50% more efficient, then we can actually issue certificates for each unit per the IRS. Um, the IRS has a way that they want us to issue the certificates. Um, you know, we have eligible certifiers. They have they have quite a bit of education. There's 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 it's it's uh, spelled out pretty clearly under the IRS guidelines, um, and it's an it's an it's an actual certification under penalty of perjury. So it's uh, you know it's it's um, it's it's pretty serious. And we, you know we're we're certified under Cal Certs, Resnet, uh, BIA, all all types of certifications that. that the IRS likes. So we had a, a case study, uh, the Brickyard again. Um, where was this one, Steve? This was in, that, that's the same one in Meridian, Idaho. In Meridian. In Meridian. So this this unit actually had uh, an eight plex, and um, we did the uh, energy modeling, and we looked at the mechanical systems and the building envelopes and LED lighting, and we determined that the client was eligible for $16,000 in tax credits. Now, this is something, you know, prior to buying the FIG unit that they really didn't even know about. Or, um, you know, a year ago, Steve, I would say that most folks didn't even know that they were eligible for this. Mm -hmm. It's um, true. I, did, I was trying. eligible. I didn't know. Yeah. So we're just trying to raise where it is. It's kind of like uh, hidden treasures, you know, for FIG owners. So it's a nice thing, and most folks are able to use the credits. Um, everybody, is, you know, it's a it's a taxpayer by taxpayer situation, and I'm happy to walk anybody who's interested through the process. Okay, so this was the Bridgestone Crossing. Now this one is down in this is in Texas, is that right? Yeah, that's in Spring, Texas. In Spring, Texas. I think it's almost the same plan as the Brickyard, and yeah. you know, again. $8,000 in tax credits, you know, a total of 200 units in the complex times $2,000 a unit. There's $400,000 in tax credits in that complex. Um, wow. Uh, this is the form that the, that the credit, one of the forms that we use, it's pretty simple, total number of units times 2,000, there's your credit. There's some other forms and, you know, this is just one of them I can walk anybody through. And I usually work pretty much hand in hand with the taxpayers uh, CPA, you know, we, we get everybody on the phone to make sure the taxpayer can use it because we know we can qualify the units. So some of the real estate benefits, we talked about the CARES Act. Now, the CARES Act, the big thing about the CARES Act is it did offer tax cuts. Um, you know, most of Biden's, I think he pretty much said all his plans, no tax cuts. So some of the some of the things that the CARES Act um, uh, fixed was there was a provision um, that folks then this applies to commercial property. There was a, what's called qualified improvement property, which had typically had been um, uh, treated as 15 year property and they were subject to 100% bonus. They left that out of the Cat Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, so they fixed it in the CARES Act. So any type of qualified improvement property, which really means that you've owned a, a, you've owned a piece of commercial property and you've been placed in service for more than two years, and then you're gonna go in and make a sort of a tenant improvement, you can really expense that 100% as qualified improvement property. And that was left out of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Um, but the hugest thing I think is right here, this, this five-year carry back for NOLs, um, using cost seg to generate it and then getting rid of the loss limitations for taxpayers because they those loss limitations you couldn't take 100 percent of the loss you were capped at 80 percent, but they lifted those um and then there's some of these other programs that i think most people are familiar with uh, you can actually look um, to your local state governments for some help as well um, for uh, for rent relief So this is just kind of an example. Uh, you know, you can go through this, but it basically shows um, it's when large depreciation deductions may be taken as an NOL and you can carry back those losses. 
So it, it just runs through an example and shows you what the potential savings could be. We'll send a recording out of this for those that, that really like digging into that stuff. Yeah, I don't want to go through this, these slides to death right now. If anybody has any questions. No, keep them alive. Keep them alive. It's fine. And then, so this was again, COVID, the COVID-19 wartime response plan. Um, an additional loans forgivable up to 10 grants. Um, I think we know about the SBA disaster loans and on and on and on. Um, so let's talk about some of Biden and Trump's uh, tax plan consideration. I'm sorry if some of these slides are a little blurry, but you know, right now, the current law, we've got 21% corporate taxes. And the nice thing is that there's this 20% overall deduction that most businesses get. Now, Biden wants to raise taxes to 28% on corporate level and then phase out the deduction over 400,000. He wants to put income at the top bracket, raise it back up to 39.6. Itemized deductions, he wants to cap those at 28%. You know, long-term capital gains and dividends, that's, that's the 20% the, the plus the 3.8% in that investment income tax. You know, he, there's talk about him wanting to double or 396 you know, the, the top. So that's where you got that 0.4 there. Um, again, social security payroll tax, he wants to take the income uh, caps off. And the step up in basis, that's a huge thing for folks looking at uh, you know, estate planning. And then here's, uh, you know, it's the, kind of the same thing written in a different way. We just talked about it. And then here's an income example. And I apologize how blurry this slide is. I really have to be like four feet away from that. You can go through that on your own. Um, and then this is a visualization of the CARES Act, where the money's going, the sources, um, who's, who's receiving the money. Um, you know, a lot of it was just handed out in checks. And that would be the households. Um, again, this is part of that, another visualization of the 1.9 stimulus package, which is the American Rescue Plan. Um, this was, uh, when did this pass again? That, that was uh, uh, shortly after COVID started? I, no, this one is, I think, was just after he took office in March, the, this, this one. And then, okay. the CARES, and then this one was, this one was under Trump, the CARES Act. I, I got you. Okay. And then, so then after this one, I think we have the, you know, there's a jobs act and I think he's got uh, an infrastructure plan too. So he, he being what, Biden, correct? Biden, right. okay. Exactly. So I think the American, I think we have an infrastructure bill on the, on the table right now. And I think we have the American jobs act, which may have, I don't know if that's been passed yet, or that might be what they're calling the infrastructure plan. Um, I see. I see. Um, so this one here, that's why I was mentioned, you know, if there's some folks in Utah, maybe looking for some uh, housing assistance or rent relief. Uh, there's some, there's some, there's some options there. Yeah. They gave out a bunch of federal money and uh, some property managers knew how to access it. Others didn't. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's that's the kind of the conclusion. It, it really, I wanted to open it up to questions, and then, you know, folks feel free to reach out to me at the uh, the email or call me at the number. So, so bottom line is, we're looking at potentially a much higher capital gains rate, and yeah. uh, some of those business deductions phasing out. Have you heard any rumblings about uh, um, cost seg, which you said was going to start to phase out in twenty twenty three anyway? Is that correct? No, cost seg won't because cost seg is that's those are court one cases, you know, hospital corp of America. But what what I'm concerned is, is, is the bonus depreciation. And that's the ability to take the unusually large first year uh, deductions. Now, mm -hmm. cost segregation in general, you know, front loads your five and 15 year deductions. So most of your benefit is really seen over the first five years of cost seg, because typically you know, the, the, the five-year property is going to be sort of between 17 and, you know, 22 to 25%. And your five-year property on a duplex is, or a fourplex, excuse me, is probably going to be about six to 8%. So of, that's 15-year property. 15-year property is land improvements. Um, so sidewalks, curbs, gutters, parking lots. 
those are the things you can see from uh, underground utilities and other uh, drainage and all that. That's what you can't see. That's also may or may not be part of it, depending. And you know, most of the the flooring and the cabinets and your just various things inside an apartment building that you can see and then what you can't see. That's fiber. That okay. and bonus depreciation on that has only been around since you know 927 to 17. So it's sort of been a bonanza for folks who own real estate and cost segregation. So I okay. see that maybe going away. <laughs> you think, oh man, I'm gonna cross my fingers. I yeah, between that I would try that. I would try to harvest it as much as you can this year. <laughs> okay. Okay. If, yeah, you probably have nothing to lose. Um, you got to got to get it. So that and capital gains and any other big boogeyman that, uh, that you're thinking about. This is a big one. Um, and this step up basis. So people who are looking at doing some estate planning, you know, it doesn't seem like there are any homes out there less than a million dollars now. So if people, <laughs> the folks bought this house way back when and, you know, for a hundred thousand dollars, and now it's worth a million. Well, you got a nine hundred thousand dollar gain there. With well, the way the tax loss stands now, upon death, that property is stepped up. So there's no gain, right? A million. So a hundred thousand dollar house is stepped up to a million dollars. So if you sell that million dollar house, there's no gain. Mm -hmm. So it's very favorable, and and also the deduction, um, the uh, exemption is. Uh, it's over $10 million under Obama. It was, it's, it was five something. Now it's close to 11. They're going to bring that back down to about 5 million. Have you heard so anything credible on 1031 exchanges? I know they may, they, they're looking to, to eliminate those as well. So you know, hmm. that, that, I don't know. I think there's just too many Democrats that own real estate. So <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so they could eliminate it, but there might be a, a backdoor option. Uh, who knows? Well, well it, here's it, the it, thing about 1031. What they're looking to do is um, any gain that's over a million, a half of, they're, they're looking at two different numbers, a half a million dollars and a million dollars. So any gain that's over a half a million or a million, somewhere in there is the numbers they're throwing around, will be subject to the tax and, 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 and not, you cannot defer that. Uh, so I see. Excellent. Excess of a half a million, excess of a million. That's what I've heard tossed around. So if you had a so, gain of, let, let's say they do the half a million. If you had a gain of 600,000, you're free and clear on that 500, but then you're going to pay the, the tax on them 100. Right. But you still Just have to move. do, yeah. yeah, you still have to do a 1031. Right. Right. So you, it, and the going through them, you know, that's not an easy process, especially Tell in today's market, trying to identify a property, right? It's in the time constraints, it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, we have got uh, some questions loading into the chat here that I'd like to address. Anything you wanna say before we start throwing some of those at? No, let's, uh, let's listen. To some <laughs> let's see, I think some of these are gonna be, you know, talk to your accountant uh, type, type questions, but we'll see one, the very first one that came in, if I can't use all cost seg in year one, can I get a loss carry forward to the following years? Yes, you absolutely can. And there's, there's no limitation on that. Okay. There we go. Just, uh, typically you couldn't carry it back, but the carry back is something that's very important to examine as well. If you might need it. I see. Um, you went into this a little bit and I think, um, I, we, it may be a whole nother webinar, but, uh, how can we become considered active investors versus passive? I mean, that really is the 750 hours of material participation and so on and so forth. Is you know, I didn't want to put up there what qualifies and what doesn't, but I do have a list of some things that I've gathered over the years, you know, working with multiple practitioners, um, you know, what I think may qualify and doesn't qualify. So if you want to reach out to me by email, I'd be happy to send you that list. Okay. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, we'll go to the screen with your contact info. Is your email on that, that slide? I can't recall. Yeah. If not, then I can put it in the chat as well for everybody to look at there. Ah, yep. There it is. There it is. Um, well, interesting. Okay. 
And I, I, I would just add, it was on your slide, but you didn't talk about it. I, I tell people all the time, this is the holy grail of tax planning. And once again, I'm not your accountant, talk to your accountant, but when you've got one spouse who's working and earning W-2, but you have another one that doesn't have a full-time job, the key is, is that spouse can be the one to manage and deal with the real estate, frees up your overall tax return to be an active investor. And that's when you can really hammer away at the taxes that are hitting the W-2 spouse. Is that a fair uh, statement, Mark? Or did I just blaspheme the tax gods? No, I would agree with that. But it has to be done very carefully and, and yeah. it needs to be high, highly documented. But yes, that's, uh, I have a lot of clients. So we, we had a lot of clients who were athletes and we would encourage their wives to become real estate professionals. A lot of clients <laughs> are doctors and dentists and, you know, it, it could be, you know, it, it could be their husbands too, right? But either way, their spouse to become yeah. a, a real estate professional. Um, and, you know, with, we see a lot of that with the professions, doctors, dentists, athletes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. The high W-2 earners make your, uh, figure out a, a pathway to get your spouse to be a real estate professional. It's bottom line. Um, okay. Here's a question. Isn't there an issue with depreciating early in that if you sell the property, the IRS wants the money back? I say there yeah. is depreciation recapture. Um, you know, we used to say if you're going to sell the property um, within five years, it may not be worth the cost site. But mm -hmm. now with the rate differential, right, you might want to take, you can create losses, right? It, it just depends on what tax bracket you're in. Because the, the cost side can bring you down into a different tax bracket. So that has to be examined as well. So it, it's not as simple as it might seem. And yes, right now they call that depreciation recapture. So any, any ex excess depreciation, you'll have to, if you sell it within a certain period of time, you're going to have to pay the recapture. That, that was taxed at ordinary income, which is, was 39.6 and now it's 37. But with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they actually tax it at 25% right now. So it's, it's not as much as you might think, but it's, they're probably going to do that. Just, just think that anything that was done in, under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017, Anything that was done by Donald Trump is going to be undone. That's, or at least they're going to try. Yeah, yeah that's, the, okay. that's the mindset. That's yeah. what you're dealing with. I got you. So you, but it, it, it could be a case where, you know, we're losing some in column A, but you're making it up over in column B. So everybody needs to get with their tax advisor uh, yeah, individually on a question like that. It is. It's, and it's a time value of money calculation. So it, de it depends on the size of, you know, but yeah. typically, you know, typically the old under the old rules, if you're going to sell the property within five years, it's probably and it's the only property you have. You know, it's, it's probably not a good idea to do cost segregation. But those 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 rules are kind of out of the window now. You really have to look at a case by case basis. Right. Yeah. I personally, I don't plan on on selling mine. I, I take the JG Wentworth strategy. It's my money, and I need it now. Right. And I, you know, I want those tax breaks today, and I just plan on holding for cash flow. But yeah, if you're a, if you're a short-term investor, you you might just create a bigger problem uh, by doing that. Okay. Um, if my fig units finish in 2021 or 2022, can I take the carryback loss to my tax returns in 19 or 20? Um, you know, that depends. 2021. No, you know the. the the carrybacks only arise from losses generated in years 2018 to 2020. So now, um, okay. but, you know, if you started in 2020, you know, we, we, you know, we have to have the conversation with your account. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's not a hard no. All right. Is there an income limitation to some of these tax credits and write-offs like 45 L can you make too much money? Cost seg, can you make too much money and not be eligible? Well, it depends on if you're active or passive with cost segregation. So the really the, you know, if you can generate act, uh, active losses, that's when it can be really efficient. So somebody needs to be a real estate professional. Um, you know, if you have other 
plenty of other uh, passive income. Cost segregation is great because you can you know you can use grouping rules to <clears throat> to take the depreciation on the current fig purchase and spread it around your other properties. Okay. So you, yes, okay. you can. And you know, with the there there are AMT considerations, alternative minimum tax considerations with the forty five L tax credits, but it's not like you're looking at a a two hundred unit, you know, four hundred thousand dollar tax credit. You know, typically these are eight thousand dollars at a time. So, you know, I I had a client who had thirty eighteen units, six eighteen units, thirty two thousand tax credit. And they could only use like $23,000 of tax credits in the current year. But the tax credits have a 22 year life. You can actually carry them back one year, use them in the current, and carry them forward up to 20 years. So at some time or another point in time, you're going to be able to use them. I see. I see. Okay. Um, I know the answer to this one, but Adam's asking it. I don't think he's going to like the answer. With a fig fourplex that is stacked and it's so it's four stories. Can you get the 45L on three of the units? No. Mm -mm. The whole, I told you he wasn't going to like it. Okay. The whole but we can get you another additional. There is another deduction that you can get. Okay. It's up to $1.80 a square foot. I just don't know if it would be you know, cost effective. I don't know if the square foot. Exists. Okay. So Adam, make sure you email Mark and he'll, uh, he'll visit with you about that. Uh, here's one. We want you to look at your crystal ball. What's your best guess on the final negotiated capital gains rate and its timing start? Um, oh man. You know, they, they, they're trying to go with that 39.6. Um, I'm thinking maybe 28, 25 to 28 and probably start next year. All right. Okay, when we do this next year for the update, we're gonna we're gonna see we're gonna see how close you were. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I'll send you a fig hat or something if you uh, if you got it right. If not, then we'll just shame you and go from there. Um, let's see here. Uh, somebody asked, "What's the reasoning to eliminate the 1031 exchange?" Well, it's more more revenue, I guess. Yes. But uh, we yeah, okay. To, to, to force the real estate market into a grinding halt. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reasoning. Okay. Um, here, this is a, a pretty specialized question. Will the capital gain deferred through an opportunity zone remain at the existing rate or would it be paid at the future rate when it comes due? Uh, no, those capital gains, those will be, so in whatever they are in 2016 is what you're going to have to pay. Okay. Um, I, I had heard that they don't want to mess around with those opportunity zones much. Uh, I don't know how credible that is, but that no, seems to, yeah. The thing with an opportunity zone is you got to make sure you have, right, a liquidity event or the money to pay the taxes in 2016. Right. Um, which are, I guess they come to, and, you know, those returns will be filed in 2017, but you still got to pay them in 2016. So, uh, but those are great. I mean, if you, you know, if you've got a 10 year hold time horizon, opportunity zones are great. They really are because you, you can keep your, your principal and you only have to invest your capital gain portion. Okay, okay. Um, we probably have time for just a couple more. They, they just keep coming. <laughs> it's like none of these people wanna pay taxes, Mark. I don't know what their problem is. So well, you can always reach out to me individually. I know a lot about the opportunity zones as well. And I know FIG has some great project, uh, projects for opportunity zones as well. Yes, yeah, we've got a couple of those going. Um, okay, we'll do a couple more then we're gonna have to, to punch out. But uh, here's one, I know the 100% bonus depreciation will start to phase out in 2023 through 2026. But isn't 100% bonus depreciation for a new construction still going to be available? since I believe that was possible before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. My understanding is that the Tax Cut and Jobs Act unlocked 100% bonus depreciation for existing buildings or acquisitions, but new construction was always possible. You would hope so, right? I mean, because that makes 100% sense um, in terms of stimulating the economy. You know, construction is a five uh, times multiplier on the economy. Um, I think we've all seen that just in realizing the supply chain shortages that have, that have beset us in the last six months. But I would, I would hope 
that whoever's you know writing this legislation would would see the value of of construction and hopefully it won't affect the properties because of that. Well, I think everybody will we'll all agree to cross our fingers on that one. Um, let's do a couple more here. Is there or could there be any kind of coordination between FIG owners for the 45L energy tax advantages for under construction FIG properties? I mean, I think he's essentially asking, Mark, you know, do we all have to pay for the site visit? And, uh, you know, I know you've uh, kind of knocked these out project by project, correct? Right. Yeah. And you can just reach out to me for, you know, individual pricing. We can, yeah. You know. Yeah. But, but typically we set that up and, uh, you know, we coordinate with Mark for those site visits because that's the priciest part of these studies. Oftentimes, is you got to pay somebody to uh, to go out there wherever your your real estate is. And you know, the uh, the biggest part of it is the contingent liability, right? Because we we do provide a hundred percent audit defense. So you don't you don't you don't have to worry about us not being there to defend the studies. And you know, we probably did thousands and thousands of studies last year on, on, on energy certifications and you know we don't ha we haven't been audited once the only thing that we were audited on once is because they don't have the, the technical wherewithal to audit what we do um, on the energy modeling side but they do have the ability to look at the placed in service date and when you claim the, the credits Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, just reach out to me on that because the credits are supposed to be, there's, there are criteria on when those credits are supposed to be uh, claimed. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, in short, multiple FIG investors use Mark in, in every project for a 45L. So there's usually, right, you know, talk to Mark directly on that, but we, we, we can and do coordinate on that stuff. Um, let's see, our FIG unit was built in 2020 and completed in 2021. What year would be the first year? I feel like that's like a math problem. <laughs> well, so the, the IRS, you know, the, the way the statute is written is the, there's, there's substantial completion, right? Then there's, so is that a certificate of occupancy? Probably yes. And then they want the units to be leased or sold. So this is what we see. We see units that maybe have the certificate of occupancy at the end of 2020, but you don't actually get them leased until 2021. So that's actually when you would claim the credit in 2021. Now, okay. remember, you can carry that credit back one year. So, but you, you can't do all that until 2021. I see. Okay. Okay. But here's another thing I wanted to throw out there. Um, so we know this, we know these are going to roll off uh, 45L at the end of the year. And you know, I've seen this with bigger projects because I've been doing this you know, now for over 10 years, going back to 2006. And when this provision sunsets, you know, we see people get, you know, they've got hundreds of units on the chalkboard or the drawing board and they're getting, they're getting ready to complete them, but they're not leased. And I've seen people, you know, go to companies like Airbnb and just get a master lease for their whole building. So anyway, my point is there are workarounds. So Okay, uh, okay. Don't despair, don't, don't despair. Don't despair. You, you've said a few despairing things though. So, I'm, you know, but I, I think like you said, there should be some workarounds here. So Mark's contact information is on the screen. Mark at specialtytaxadvisors.com. We really appreciate him joining us. We really appreciate all of you joining us as well. And uh, now that the world appears to at least think about normalizing a little bit, we look forward to bringing more content out and, and hopefully returning to some of our, our in-person networking events that we used to do. So keep your eyes peeled for that as well. Everybody have a great night. Thanks again. Talk to you later. All right. Thanks, guys.